Uh, good afternoon and greetings from the University of Bern in the capital city of Switzerland. My name is Dwayne Schultes and I'd like to welcome you to this webinar discussing the outcomes of Work Package 4 of the IMI program Get Real. Today we'll be looking at how real-world evidence can be used in network meta-analyses and outcomes predictions. I'm very pleased to be joined today by four people leading Get Real's Work Package number four. They are Matthias Eger. Hello, Matthias. Hi. Hello. Uh, Eva Maria Didden. Hello, Eva Maria. Hello. Uh, Georgia Salanti. Hi. Hello. And on the phone, Christine Fletcher. Unfortunately, she could not join us here in person in the glorious sunlight. How are you, Christine? I'm good, thank you. Welcome, everyone. Thank you very much. So, obviously, we've had several hundred registrations. We've actually had 300 registrations to the webinar. So, unfortunately, we're not able to open up the phones for, to have interaction, but you can ask questions with us. If you're having a problem or you have a question, please raise your hand and chat, and then I'll be able to get back to you and we can try and address whatever the concern is. If you're having audio issues, we have over 25 international toll-free numbers. If you're using the Skype settings and you're having issues, please feel free to switch to the telephone and dial in to clear up your audio. And then there's a question log, and that's how we will be taking questions. So if you go to the questions bar and just click on the little star, it'll open up and you can ask all your questions. We will certainly be asking your questions as we go forward, and we'll try and reserve some time at the end to make sure that we answer any questions that you have. So just uh, one quick bit of advertisement. On the 17th of June, uh, there'll be a public conference in London, Get Real, putting real-world health data to work. And this is upon invitation. So please go to the IMI Get Real website or the vitaltransformation.com website, and we will do everything possible to make sure we can get you in attendance. So with that, I now pass to Matthias Egger, who will give us a short introduction of Work Packet for Matthias. The mouse is yours. OK. <laughs> Thanks, Duane. Um, I have to admit, this is my first uh, webinar, so I'm feeling very excited but also a bit <laughs> nervous. Um, as Duane has said, Get Real is really about incorporating real-life data into drug development. And as shown on this slide, uh, developing uh, an understanding um, of probably advance the slide. How do I do that? Just, just click Oops. just click the left. There you go. There can, you go. You, can you advance it? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you okay, go. okay. Sorry about that. So this slide basically shows the structure of the Get Real Consortium. And as I said, it's really about developing an understanding amongst um, healthcare decision makers on how real world evidence could be used uh, in drug development. And um, there are four work packages and today we're really going to talk about how evidence synthesis and modeling could be used to bridge the efficacy effectiveness gap. So the, the sort of high level key questions are how well can relative effectiveness be estimated from phase two, phase three, really tightly controlled, randomized controlled efficacy studies, and how can um, observational data and uh, RCTs uh, be integrated to address specific decision-making needs of HDA bodies and uh, regulatory agencies, and how can relative effectiveness be predicted from available efficacy and observational data. So th these are the sort of high-level issues that we we are grappling with in uh, Work Package 4. And the next slide really shows more, more detailed, concrete questions on the journey from efficacy to real-world effectiveness. So we may be asking how efficacious and safe is this drug, and we'll be in tightly controlled study conditions. We will be using clinical trials, RCTs, phase two, phase three, and standard meta-analysis. And at the end, other end of the spectrum, point four, we might ask how effective and safe is this drug compared to an alternative therapy in the patients who will actually likely receive the drug in the real world of a healthcare system. And we're now in real world conditions and we will use mathematical modeling, for example, based on phase two, phase three trials, clinical um, registries, uh, etc. And somewhere in between point two, um, 
is how efficacious and safe is this drug compared to alternative therapies if we maintain the study conditions, but um, we also stick to the typical patients included in clinical trials. And it's really this point two and point four that we will be addressing in um, the next talks. And with that, I, I'm, I'm handing over to Georgia Salanti, <coughs> Georgia Salanti um, who will be talking about network meta-analysis. Thank you, Matthias. Yes, I will show you a framework about estimating and appraising treatment effects using both randomized and real-world evidence. I will outline the methodology using a case study from the field of mental health. We want to compare the effectiveness of 15 antipsychotics in schizophrenia, and we have access to 168 randomized controlled trials that compare either pairs of active drugs or an active drug versus placebo. We also have access to real-world evidence in the form of a large cohort study that involves 11,000 patients, and we have patient-level data available for, eight for sorry, five antipsychotics. This is how the evidence looks like for the randomized studies. Each node represents a treatment. We also have placebo. And each edge represents at least one randomized study comparing pairs of interventions. The size of the nodes is proportional to the number of patients randomized in each treatment. And note that there are some drugs that haven't been compared in any uh, randomized controlled trial. How network meta-analysis works? We want to put together all these randomized studies that compare different pairs of treatments and obtain a hierarchy of the interventions according to their effects. At the heart of network meta-analysis is indirect comparison. Say we want to compare amisulpride versus olanzapine, but there are no studies comparing these two antipsychotics. But there are studies comparing amisulpride versus risperidone and risperidone with olanzapine. Then we can do a meta-analysis of all the studies amisulpride versus risperidone, of the studies of olanzapine versus risperidone, and then we subtract the two summary effects to, to obtain what is called indirect evidence. And in our data set, we actually have studies that directly compare these two treatments, amisulpide versus olanzapine, and this provides direct evidence. If we put together these two sources of evidence, we obtain network or mixed treatment effects. And this idea can be extrapolated to the entire network of interventions where direct and indirect evidence flow via various intermediate routes and treatments. For an up-to-date technical review of the methods used to obtain um, direct, indirect, and network meta-analytic estimates, please refer to our recent publication in the research synthesis methods. This is the output from network meta-analysis. I realize this is a very dense slide, but what I want to, to, to highlight here is that network meta-analysis has the potential to estimate relative treatment effects for all pairs of interventions. In the diagonal of this matrix are the names of the drugs, and in the lower triangle are the standardized mean difference for improvement in symptoms in a scale for schizophrenia symptoms um, between pairs of drugs. And note that there are no blank, no empty cells. This means that network meta-analysis can provide relative treatment effects for all treatment comparisons, even for those for which no randomized trials exist, like, for example, pariperidol versus aripiprazole. That's a much nicer way to present the results from network meta-analysis. These are, again, the standardized mean differences of all active drugs versus placebo. And they are presented according to the rank for efficacy. So clozapine seems to be the best intervention if you're interested in improving symptoms, followed by amisulpride and then olanzapine. 
These were the results from the network meta-analysis that used randomized studies. But as I said in the beginning, we also have evidence uh, from a obser large observational study about five drugs. Network meta-analysis provides valid results only when the transitivity assumption holds. The transitivity assumption requires that the effect modifiers are evenly distributed across the various comparisons. One can imagine that this assumption might be difficult to defend in practice when we have both real-world evidence and randomized studies, because these two sources of evidence might have important differences in inclusion criteria, settings, methods, etc. So there might be discrepancies between direct and indirect evidence, and this is what is called statistical inconsistency, but there might also be differences between the real-world evidence and the randomized evidence. Let us consider this hypothetical example about the five drugs for which we have both randomized and observational evidence. From now on, drugs will be anonymized, and let's pretend we are only interested for the comparison drug 3 versus drug 4. For that comparison, we have direct randomized evidence, indirect randomized evidence, direct real-world evidence from the observational studies, and indirect non-randomized evidence. So these four sources of evidence might be in agreement or in disagreement, and by contrasting statistically the results from the various meta-analyses, we can detect their agreement or not. So this is an example from using our data set uh, from schizophrenia. Uh, this is about the comparison drug 4 versus drug 15. And this is an example where direct and indirect evidence do not agree very much. Direct observational evidence is in broad agreement with the direct randomized evidence. This is another example from our database about the comparison drug 4 versus drug uh, six, you can see that direct randomized evidence and indirect randomized, they are in agreement, but the direct observational evidence about that particular comparison is a bit different. So what do we do when we observe differences between the various sources of evidence? The first thing to do is to check whether the assumptions hold. We should look at the effect modifiers, we should um, investigate any differences in included populations and settings. The best way forward is an individual patient network meta-regression where patient level covariance should be taken into account. For an overview of such methods, please refer to our recent publication in Research Synthesis Method. What about residual disagreement? Once you have explained all difference between um, randomized and non-randomized evidence, there still might be some residual disagreement. And there is the, the dilemma whether you should discard completely randomized evidence or include it in your analysis. We believe that it's better to include it and explore the impact of various degrees of credibility that can be attached to the real-world evidence. So randomized studies are believed to have a higher credibility because they typically pertain to lower risk of bias compared to observational studies. On the other hand, real-world evidence may have higher relevance and higher external validity and generalizability. Uh, researchers are often reluctant to put together these two pieces of evidence because they think they compromise the higher credibility uh, that uh, the randomized studies offer. So there are three different ways to synthesize the randomized studies with the real-world evidence while different assumptions about the credibility of the observational studies are accounted for. I will outline only two ways. Underlying both methods um, is the concern that non-randomized studies might pertain to the high risk of bias but may also have large precision, because typically non-randomized studies have higher sample size. So to address the issue of high risk of bias, 
we can involve a bias correction parameter beta. And to address the issue of overprecision, we can involve a parameter W. And to use this W parameter to reduce uh, the precision of the real world evidence by dividing the variance. In that way, the influence or the contribution of the observational studies when combined with, real, with, with randomized studies is less. So the first model is the design-adjusted analysis, where each study is adjusted separately. We need to have um, the beta parameter, which adjusts for bias, and we need to have also the W parameter that decreases the weight it carries in the summary effect. If W is set to 1, then real-world evidence is taken at face value. When W is 0, we simply ignore the real-world evidence. Of course, pinpointing exact values for beta and W might be a difficult task. We involve uh, expert opinion uh, and we recommend a sensitivity analysis. Investigators should change the value of W and control the amount of confidence they want to place to the real-world evidence. And these are the results from the antipsychotics network. We didn't do any adjustment for bias. And we involved a single W parameter because we had only one large non-randomized study. And I present the results only for one comparison, drug 4 versus drug 6. And this is the standardized mean difference as we use different values for W. W0 means that we use only randomized studies. W1 means we do the naive pooling where randomized and non-randomized study are put together without any further consideration. And in between, we have different degrees of competence attached to the real-world evidence. We conclude that the summary estimate for that particular comparison is fairly robust to different degrees of confidence attached to the real-world evidence. Results from other comparisons in the network are even less sensitive to the amount of confidence placed in non-randomized studies. The second way to encompass real-world evidence in network meta-analysis is to use it as a prior. Observational studies can be put together to form a prior distribution, which within a Bayesian setting can be combined with the observation of data, with, with the observed data, that is the randomized study, to give a posterior summary effect. Of course, the prior distribution can be adjusted for bias and down-weighted as well using this W component. Uh, we need to realize that dividing the variance of the prior distribution by W is equivalent to raising the likelihood function to a power alpha. So these are the results. Uh, again, for the same comparison, drug 4 versus drug 6, where um, the, the registry data are used to form prior, and then we combine it with randomized evidence to obtain posteriors. We don't do, again, any bias adjustment, and we use a single alpha parameter in the normal likelihood from the registry. Um, alpha now, it's not just a single number, it's a whole distribution. It has a uniform distribution um, between 0 and 0 0.3, or between 0 0.7 and 0 0.3. And one, um, reflecting different degrees of confidence to real-world evidence. Again, we don't see much difference between different assumptions about the alpha parameter. Now that we have pulled together observational data and randomized data, we need to infer about the risk of bias in the overall result. In a network meta-analysis that includes real-world evidence, there is still some impact even if we have downweighted the observational studies. There are some RCTs that might pertain to high risk of bias, and evidence from studies flows directly and indirectly. How are we going to infer about the risk of bias? We suggest to practice problem using the contribution matrix. The contribution matrix estimates how much information is contributed by each study. We use this information matrix in the naive analysis where real-world evidence and randomized studies are put together without any further consideration. 
and the contribution from the real world evidence accounted for 5.8% of the total information in the network. That is interesting because the sample size of the observational study is about 20% of the total sample size in the network. If we discount the evidence uh, from, the, from the registry and we use um, a W component of 0 0.5, then the real-world evidence contributed 5% of, of, of the information. So we understand that the risk of bias in the network meta-analysis result is largely dictated by the risk of bias in the included randomized studies because the real-world evidence had very little influence in the results. So what's the take-home message? If you are concerned about residual differences between randomized control studies and real-world evidence, or if you think that real-world evidence is less trustworthy than randomized evidence, then simply decrease the influence of the real-world evidence in your estimates by dividing the variance by a factor of W. Of course, it is difficult to predict the magnitude or the direction of possible biases introduced by including real-world evidence, and this is why we advise for a sensitivity analysis. We also recommend that the risk of bias in the results is evaluated after considering the relative contribution of each source of evidence in the pooled estimates. And once real-world evidence and randomized evidence is put together in a network meta-analysis, the results could be extrapolated using mathematical modeling to make predictions in a real-world set. And this will be the topic of the next presentation. Thank you very much. So now we're going to pass to Eva Maria. I'd like to point out to everyone, please feel free to submit your questions. We'll be answering them uh, as soon as we get through the material. We're going to continue to press on. So Eva Maria, please, the mouse is yours. Well, so welcome, everyone, to my a presentation on the prediction of real-world treatment effect based on RCT and real-world evidence. And I will illustrate our approach and results with the help of a case study on rheumatoid arthritis. Um, this presentation refers to the fourth row of the table Matthias Egger showed in the beginning, meaning that it addresses the question how effective a drug is compared to alternative therapies in patients who will likely receive this drug in real world. Let me first of all show you this graphic as a, motiv as a motivation. And throughout the whole presentation, as an outcome measure, I will focus on the DAS28 after six months. This means the DAS28 is a disease activity score, um, which is based on the number of swollen and tender joints in the hands and feet of the patients. And we compare two different therapies. One therapy are conventional DMARDs, meaning conventional disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs, and a new biologic agent. And as you can see here in this graphic, um, patients participating in the randomized controlled trials benefit more from the new biologic treatments than patients in the real world. So we see that there is an obvious gap, which of course one reason for this gap is uh, the inclusion criteria in trials. And we see that it's important, and this is what Georgia said right before, that we don't just merge these data to predict real world treatment effects, that we set up a model in a very careful way. Our exact research question is the following. We want to set up a mathematical model which allows us to pre predict the real-world treatment effects in patients with rheumatoid arthritis if we already have RCT data on the new treatment. But we do not have any observational data on this new treatment. However, we have observational data on an existing similar treatment so that we know which are the drivers of treatment decision. This is a very important slide, since this slide shows us why we cannot just merge um, RCT and real-world evidence and just set up a normal linear regression model. Assuming RCT conditions due to the randomization 
the covariates don't have an impact on treatment decision. So it's a random decision whether a patient receives treatment or not. So here we don't have any specific causal structure. However, in the real world, there's a medical doctor who decides who receives the new treatment and who doesn't. And so we have actually three sorts of covariates. We have the so-called confounders. These are covariates that have an impact on treatment decision, but also on treatment outcome. In our RA case study, this is, for example, age. Then we have covariates that have an impact on treatment only. For example, the calendar year. A treatment can only be administered if it's already on the market. And then we have covariates of type V. These are non-confounding covariates. These are covariates that have an impact on outcome only. For example, gender. On this slide, I have some formulas, but I don't want to show them to you now. In case you have any questions, I can go into the technical details later on. Coming back to the RA case study. Um, as I already said, our outcome of interest is to change in DAS28. The lower the DAS28 is, the better. And this is a measure which, which is very often reported, almost in all studies. This is why we decided to focus on this outcome, on this outcome measure. Then to figure out which covariates are important and which covariates belong to which category, we first of all um, ask some clinical experts. We ask them which are confounders, which are covariates that have an impact on treatment only, and which are covariates that have an impact on outcome only. And we came to the conclusion that we should necessarily consider BMI and obesity as a covariate of type V, and we should necessarily include age disease duration and seropositivity in our model. And then additionally, we ran some statistical analysis um, to figure out which covariates we should also consider. And these are, for example, gender, steroid intake, the number of concomitant DMARCs, and the baseline hug. The baseline hug is uh, the health assessment questionnaire results. And then we should also consider the DAS at baseline and the number of previous anti-TNF agents. Based on this knowledge, we can now think about modeling. So our aim and what we did is we de developed a mathematical model which is informed by observational evidence on treatment decision, but also on RCT evidence on the efficacy of the new treatment and on all signif significant effect modifiers and prognostic factors. Additional evidence can be included in the form of prior information. Then the aim is, our first aim to, is, is to predict free river treatment effect for the given RCT populations. And to do so, we first of all predict treatment decision based on real world evidence. So what we know from the doctors and what we know from guidelines goes into um, this part of the model. And the next step is to predict treatment outcome using evidence from the available RCTs. Another point is to predict treatment effect for a new real-world patient population or a subpopulation of interest. And to do so, we also use the evidence from the available RCTs. Let us have a look at some results. So here you see um, the predicted treatment outcomes versus the um, treatment outcomes under real-world conditions for a given RCT population. And interestingly, the predicted um, real-world outcomes are between, for the new biologic treatment, are between the observed um, treatment outcomes under RCT conditions and, as you will see later, the observed um, treatment outcomes for a real-world population. Why may the predicted effectiveness, effectiveness be lower than the observed efficacy? We guess that this is because only about 10% of the trial particip participants would receive the biologic agent at all. And these are 
the um, patients who are more uh, severely ill. So this is why we assume that um, we have such an unexpected results. And then why could the a predicted effectiveness be higher than the effectiveness observed in real world? And this is, we think, because of the strict RCT inclusion criteria. Now let us have at the look, let us have a look at the outcomes for um, the new real world population. Here when we compare the observed real world outcomes to the predicted outcomes, we see that for the conventional DMARCs, there is quite a difference in the box plots, in the summary statistics. Whereas when we look at the new biologic agent, the, um, predictors, the predicted outcomes are much closer to the observed outcomes. And we guess that we should have a look at our model again. We should think about whether we might have insufficient prior information or whether we should consider more effect modifiers and prognostic factors. So this really tells us that we should further work on this. And so here you see our final results. And also, as I mentioned before, here you can clearly see that the predicted real-world outcomes for the for the RCT population, for the new biologic treatments, lie between the observed RCT outcomes and the observed outcomes for the real-world population. We posed ourselves an uh, additional question. Uh, we were wanted to know how, what the treatment outcomes are for a new RA population if all patients received the biologic agent or all patients take the conventional DMARCs. And here we grouped our patients into two different classes. We have patients who are more likely to receive the biologic agent, agent and patients who are more likely to receive the control agent. We did this group, grouping based on simulation studies or also on predictions. And interestingly, you see that no matter whether due to his or her baseline char characteristics, a patient is more likely to receive the new biologic agent or not, the predicted benefit is very, very similar. But we also see that patients who are more likely to receive the control agent only um, are expected to be benefit from, more from the control agent, meaning from the conventional DMARCs. And I think this is quite an interesting result. So let me sum up. Our deliverable is a Bayesian inference framework which is able to connect information from various sources of data in a very flexible way. So we can connect RCT data to real-world evidence. And we may have data on individual participant data level and on aggregate level. And our model allows us to predict real-world treatment effect and to assess and describe the efficacy effectiveness gap. Our main concerns are the predictive and external validity. It's really hard to prove this, and we're still working on approaches on how to do this somehow. Um, and yeah, we're still working on this. And we're also working, as Georgia already mentioned, on a model which allows to include results from network data analysis to predict the relative effectiveness of a new drug compared to other drugs in a whole network. And then we want to uh, um, consider dynamic treatment regimes with time-varying confounders and censoring information. This is the end of my presentation, and I now hand over to Chrissy, who will give a short conclusion. Christine, are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? We can hear you just great. So um, just tell us when you want us to advance the slides, and we'll move it along, OK? Yes, please, if you go to the next slide. Your thing? So obviously today we've we've shown you a lot of information and I, I appreciate that on the webinar there's probably a wide variety of stakeholders listening in. Some of you may be completely new to evidence synthesis. Some of you may feel that you're quite expert in these areas and obviously you're looking how, how, at how this methodology is evolving. But some of our key conclusions at the moment from Get Real are is that relative effectiveness can be estimated from randomized controlled trials, but these are complex analyses 
um, they are they need very careful considerations and as Georgia says there are some very key assumptions that need to be considered and required to understand what actually is possible and we, we are trying to promote and get real again that good scientific principles are followed to achieve a high quality analysis and what I mean by that is is that evidence synthesis needs to be um, very very carefully thought through what is your question or questions of interest to follow PICO what is your population of interest what are your interventions what are the comparators and what are the outcomes and what's the what's the feasibility of of doing any kind of evidence synthesis so being transparent in looking at what evidence do we have that could contribute to the questions that I'm trying to address so being transparent in how evidence is selected by again using for example systematic literature reviews and when we have an idea of the evidence available the feasibility of what is actually possible in particular we are very concerned about the clinical considerations in the evidence that we have. So what treatments have been are available to patients and how are they prescribed? What are the different treatment pathways that are open to patients? What are different populations of patients and how they're treated? And what are some of the outcomes that we have, both from randomized trials and real world evidence? And what are some of those effect modifiers? So a good researcher will need to think about all these in planning for an analysis. And there are lots of decisions to be made, lots of considerations to be carefully chosen, such that we will end up having to consider our primary analysis and then again, ideally having that ahead of time of, of seeing any data, but also then identifying, as Georgia said, a range of sensitivity analyses to help us really thoroughly understand the data that we have in front of us. In addition to then highly a high um, quality analysis as we conduct it and also how we report the analysis in terms of its limitations and the potential biases. But as you've seen today, and we understand in, in you know in pharmaceutical worlds, we are now having a big emphasis on different sources of data now that are now coming forward and being available for potential evidence synthesis projects. The real world evidence is now uh, much more important to us, and we have much easier access to a new source of data. And as you've seen today, there are different ways of integrating this evidence together with randomized controlled trials. And this will really help to make decision making um, at product launch for a variety of different stakeholders. But our key messages are that, again, carefully thinking through the different considerations, and as we begin to look at real world evidence, what are those contributions of the different sources of evidence that we have? To consider everything and, and, and through the different sources of potential biases, but also, in addition, what is possible to answer the questions that we're trying to answer. And it is really important that as we start to look at other sources of evidence, so not only randomized controlled trial data, but also real world evidence, to really explore a range of sensitivity analyses, because there will be assumptions that will need to be made, and these, those need to be investigated. So this is an evolving area. These are new methods. They are, they are, there are more case studies being presented all the time. And Get Real will be publishing um, the results of our case studies coming forward. We will also be making available a number of other uh, education and training materials when the project ends later this year. And finally, as, the, as Eva has shown us, there are lots of work, there is work going on about looking how we can predict um, our relative effectiveness from using randomized and real world evidence. Again, looking at mathematical models that help us to look at the efficacy and effectiveness gap that we know does exist um, and for different reasons. So we, we are suggesting that again, going into these analyses, we do now have different sources of data that can be seen as, as, as useful sources of information to at least start to inform our decision making. But that evidence does need to be very carefully critiqued in order to how best to use it. And we are looking ourselves at in terms of more validation of the approaches we've, we've, we've looked into so we can again look at ways and good practices of how to increase the accuracy of any predictions 
forms using these statistical models. So in summary, there are lots of different ways of doing evidence synthesis, whether it's using randomized trial data alone, incorporating real-world evidence, and also then using both sources to help predict effectiveness, especially when we're trying to bring a new, new medicine um, to the market and trying to estimate what that effectiveness may be when that product is launched. My final slide from the today's webinar is just to acknowledge that this work has been done by a large body of, of stakeholders. Um, a number of Get Real members have been driving this forward, especially from Work Package 4. Um, so thank you to all our collaborators from academia, from industry, from the HA agencies, the regulators, and also patient participation. Um, we've tried to take on board your comments throughout the project. We still have a lot of work to do for the rest of this year. And um, again, we, we hope that you'll look forward to um, sharing the materials that we have in further discussions that we will have with you um, between now and the end of the year to help further discuss some of these approaches. Thank you very much, Christine. Um, again, I'd like to point out we've, um, we've got several hundred of you online right now. We're going to be taking questions. Please feel free to use the question bar and send in your questions. We're going to be answering them as they come in. We've got a little uh, easy chip shot here that was sent in by Daniel Parks. Which software was used to create the network figure? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, we have programmed a little package in Stata that you can use. Um, and in one of my slides, uh, there was uh, a reference to the Stata Journal. Uh, the, the, the paper is by Haimani and Salanti. You can check that reference and it has uh, the name of the routines that we used for, the, for creating the networks, but also for creating other stuff relevant to network meta-analysis. So, shortly. So, yeah, there is a plus one paper okay. as well, but the most recent one with the updated commands is in the Stata Journal. Okay. That's and it's Christy, can I, also, can I also add that um, we are, as part of the Get Real platform, we have developed some software. It's in the framework of ADIS. It's a platform that researchers will be able to use, and, and through that you'll be able to upload data, download data from clinicaltrials.gov, for example, and also that gives you the options to them. Um, it gives you um, network diagrams as part of that software as well. But there are a variety of tools that, 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 that can do this off the shelf as well. Thank you. We've just had a, another sort of nice, easy, before we get into the hard questions that I've written, uh, <laughs> of course. Um, there's a great question here from Jingsu Wang. Uh, what do you, all four of you, think of single arm studies? What's your opinion of thing, single arm studies? Uh, who wants to take this shot at that? <laughs> That's an easy question, please. <laughs> well, I mean, a, a single arm study can be seen as a cohort study. So it's, you know, it's by definition a observational study in one um, defined a group, or perhaps I'm missing the point. Do you, do you want to chip in? <laughs> yes. Well, single arm studies look at only one intervention. Yeah. Cohort studies often have more than one intervention, so they have a sort of control group embedded in them. And we know that randomized trials are more trustworthy than non-randomized studies sure. and controlled trials are more trustworthy than uncontrolled trials. So basically single arm studies are at the bottom of trustworthiness. So I would, my personal take on that, but with, which is not necessarily get real, so my <laughs> co-presenter stance is that unless you don't have evidence at all, controlled evidence at all, in the form of case control studies, cohort studies, and of course randomized studies, then one should avoid using uncontrolled studies. Let me, let me play devil's advocate quickly. Yeah. Um, just thinking back to one of our colleagues of Battle Transformation, Bettina Rill from the Melanoma Patient Network, one of her constant refrains is, why do a two-arm study in melanoma? We know what the standard of care is, it's death. So in the cases of where you're dealing with a disease of an unmet medical need that's of a high, highly virulent nature, would there be a justification then statistically to test against a body of knowledge that you know the outcomes? I mean, we know the outcomes of melanoma, they're terrible. So, 
Yeah, I, th I think what you propose is using historical data okay. as, a, as a comparison group. And I, I think you're right, there are situations when this is, uh, you know, perfectly um, uh, sensible. Um, for example, another example is the cure of HIV. I mean, we know that when you stop antiretroviral treatment, uh, virologic uh, replication will rebound. So the question is, do you need a control group to show yeah. that? Because it's been shown a million of times. Um, uh, going back to the question of the single arm study, I think there may still be situations where uh, evidence from single arm studies could, could be useful within that framework of integrating RCT evidence and real world evidence. Um, for example, in terms of the characteristics of patients receiving the treatment or, or also, you know, some prognostic information could, uh, could be um, uh, gleaned from, from that type of study. But I mean, I agree with you. It's at the bottom of the, the pyramid. Yeah, I've got a I've got a quote here from Sebastian Schneeweiss at, at Harvard, who's been doing a lot of work with the Macquarie and Mini Sentinel, and he says um, regarding outcomes-based meta-analysis, it's spooky if you see exactly the same result everywhere, and it's extremely frustrating when you see different results everywhere. <laughs> um, so I guess the, the question is, how can we be sure we're not being swayed by dreaded false correlations when you're doing multiple data set analysis? How do you, how do you control for the multiple correlation? How do, you, how do you control against these data sets? How do you make sure we're not getting false correlations? I mean, <laughs> I, mean I, I, I think the, the, the quote basically says that if, if there's too little heterogeneity, you get suspicious that and if you get too much as well. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree. But let, let's stick to the uh, to too little. That basic, particularly in observational research, that people can influence what you know what the estimate exactly is going to look like by including or excluding variables uh, in in a multivariate model, and they they sort of possibly tend to um, make the results more similar to the previous studies than they should be. And of course, the heterogeneity question, if you have a lot of heterogeneity, then you need to, you know, you need to think about what sources of heterogeneity could be. And heterogeneity uh, is not only a problem, it's also an opportunity to gain additional insights if you can, um, you know, explain at least part of it. Mm -hmm. We've got another uh, very good question here from Florence Cost. Uh, should sensitivity analysis include observational studies that are considered less robust? or had population characteristics different than the RCT. Please advise on critical appraisals of observational studies to be included in an NMA. Yes, the, the, the framework we presented can deal with uh, observational studies that have different degrees of credibility. There might be some more credible than other ones, depending on the design. And the same for randomized studies. Some of them are better and more trustworthy than others, depending on the risk of bias they carry. Um, in the um, uh, design-adjusted model that I showed, there is the opportunity to control the influence from every single study included in the model. So, for example, if you know that a particular observational study is more trustworthy than another one, then the, the down weighting of the variance should be less for the study you believe the more. So, you can um, explore various degrees of um, of credibility attached to each study, which is represented by various va values in the W parameter, and then see how the results change. C can I, yeah, C can I just add to the second part of the question? What we you know, what instrument should be used mm -hmm. to uh, to assess the the risk of bias in observational research and. This is really something that um, I, I think there's a lot of debate on it, and there have been several reviews showing that there are many, many instruments out there. Um, but I think we're moving um, towards a consensus, at least within the Cochrane co collaboration. There, there, there is now a um, Cochrane risk of bias tool adapted um, to the um, observational world of studies, including cohort studies, case control studies, prevalence studies, etc., which will um, is not published yet, but will be published very soon. And um, I would also want to alert you to a series of articles in Research Synthesis Methods in 2013, which 
is based on a workshop that was held held in in Ottawa, and and the last paper is number six. Um, first author is uh, George Wells. Really, sort of summarizes that workshop and is is a sort of beta version, published beta version, if you like, of the uh, the Cochrane Risk of Bias Two for uh, observational studies, which will be called Robins. I Robins. understand. Yes. yes. We have um, another question from Nathan Liu. Uh, very interesting results for methodologists, but what about incorporating them into drug developments? How do you see this actually working in practice? Maybe Christine, how would you like to take a crack at that? <laughs> yeah, so, so from an industry point of view, I think um, it's, uh, there's lots of things we can do to use some of the evidence synthesis approaches to help us. Uh, you know, develop our products right through early phase to late phase. So, you know, as we start to learn more about our products and, and the early trials finish, we should be starting to look at um, evidence synthesis opportunities as, as a product is still in early phase development. What might be the comparators of interest? Where is this treatment going to fit in the treatment pathway? And why we do it in early phase is then because it can help inform our later phase trials. So by looking at what, what evidence is there, and of course we've got to be careful of publication bias as well, but we can understand what are, what are some sensitivities that might be coming forward with our evidence network, what are some of the gaps that we may have that we will not be able to fill because we'll never have a completely perfect network of evidence. We, we can't do every head-to-head -head trial that we'd like. We're going to have to make choices in development. And we want, there are different uh, you know, treatments used in clinical practice. But we do believe that starting these assessments early in development can help us to understand, well, what kind of added benefit are we going to need to see in our products as we come through some of the later phases of development in phase two and phase three, given that the landscape's going to be evolving as we get closer to launch, we can use the, the latest um, information in addition to what's known about other products that are in the clinical practice. How did the randomized controlled trial evidence compare to the real world evidence for those products? What can we learn about that for, for our product coming through? Um, the more we can do some of these approaches earlier means that we will understand the, the um, evidence better. We'll understand what are some of the sensitivities in, in our data sets, what are some of the key clinical considerations that we are really concerned about. And, and there, there will always be choices to make ultimately in, in terms of how we do these analyses. Um, from an industry point of view, we'll, be, we'll have to make some assumptions, we, but we, will, we have to be transparent about what those assumptions are but do a full range of sensitivity analyses to explore other mechanisms that perhaps we may have discounted in our, in our primary analysis. But we are, we are concerned about heterogeneity. We are concerned about how different treatments are given in clinical practice. We are concerned about different risks at baseline of certain outcomes. There are methods to adjust for those, and we can try different approaches through the sensitivity analyses. But the earlier we can start doing some of this, the better informed we will be, in addition to helping us let them generate better evidence and understanding what those gaps are, so we can tailor our, our methods to then answering the right questions that we need at product launch. Yeah, Chrissy, I'm going to just follow up on that, and this gets to what Georgia presented about trying when you're trying to choose which data you want. I mean, essentially what you have now at least in George's presentation, you have a methodology where you're looking at the real-world evidence and you're reducing the weighting based on the variance, based on the precision correlation. But from a clinical trial perspective, from an industry perspective, often that real-world evidence is more indicative of what's actually going on in clinical practice. How do you see the, the balancing those two competing results? I mean, you want the statistical viability, but you also want the real-world impact. Increasingly, that's what payers want. How do you see this tension being resolved going forward? And, and Georgia, I'll come back to you as well. So I would say that it's as Georgia has presented there, there are different analyses we can do to either increase the level of um, credibility that that data gives us, because it is the relevance that the real world data gives us versus the randomized controlled trial settings, which again are, are, are sometimes restricted. But we, we will have to make choices of what we believe is the most appropriate analysis and then 
do different analyses with different, either using different assumptions, uh, exploring the, the credibility of certain evidence sources, and again, see how robust those analyses are and, and, and you know, what, what changes and under what circumstances do those change. That's great. Well, again, it's been pretty close to an hour, and I'd just like to thank everyone for your participation. Um, any closing remarks, Matthias? Any, anything you'd like to say in, in conclusion? Well, I, I want to say I really enjoyed this uh, webinar. <laughs> Your and, first uh, webinar was yeah, okay. Webinar, yeah, it was okay. <laughs> okay and 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 I, I really I really think there's a lot of um, work still to do to better define the place of these new methods, their limitations. I mean, Chrissy was uh, highlighting that um, she highlighted sensitivity analyses uh, to, to gain a better understanding. But but at the end of the day, I really hope that these methods will move more towards mainstream and become um, uh, you know a ingredient in in drug development because I think we're throwing out a lot of useful evidence at the moment sure well again I, on behalf of um, everyone here in Zurich or excuse me in Bern forgive me <laughs> <laughs> University of Bern. and uh, Christine thank you very much for dialing in I hope uh, it was okay for you even though pity you weren't here um, I guess we'll call this webinar closed. I'd like to thank you all for your participation. So with that, uh, goodbye, everybody. Goodbye. 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 Thank you. Bye-bye. Dwayne, how did that go?